the experiences in Bosnia and Afghanistan really impacted the way I see the world. But there are many of you here who've covered other conflicts the U.S. was involved in, and I'm eager to hear what you think um, about, A, what should be happening in journalism, and B, what should be happening in Washington in terms of U.S. Um, conversation. I was in Bosnia, and I was uh, able to help expose these the executions that Mike talked about in Srebrenica. Um, that, as Mike said, only lasted 10 days. And I then had a great 13-year run, um, primarily at the Times, first on the uh, Metro desk, um, and then overseas. Um, I ran you know, towards from Brooklyn to the World Trade Center on the morning of 9-11, uh, ran for my life when the buildings collapsed, as many other journalists did, and then uh, went overseas and was the um, bureau co-chief in South Asia for the Times from 2002 to 2005. Um, that was an incredible time. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk, I mentioned this issue of Afghanistan and Bosnia and this view of the world. Um, there was real hope in Afghanistan when the Taliban fell. People were extremely happy when they fell, um, and then everything seemed to go horribly wrong. And I uh, did set off to write a book about what had gone wrong in Afghanistan. Ha was there a chance to kind of strengthen moderates in Afghanistan after 9-11 um, and the U.S. blew it, or was it simply an impossible task? And that was the focus of my book. Um, to be honest, like any journalist, and, and uh, you know, what really drove me and what caused me to make a mistake, frankly, about going to this interview with the Taliban uh, was competition. Um, and I, I felt that I had moved back to New York. Um, I'll be honest, I say this in the book I wrote with my wife. I felt I had become a New York-based journalistic fraud. Um, I was no longer based in the region. And I, um, but I knew I also wanted to change my life, and that's why I'd taken the job on the investigative unit. And I heard about a Taliban commander who had given interviews to two foreign journalists before. Uh, one of them was a French journalist, a woman who worked for France 24, and she had videotaped him twice. Uh, the other one was a Greek journalist who had videotaped him as well. Um, I met with the French journalist and said, you know, what do you think if I go to this interview, you know, what will happen? Is this person trustworthy? Um, she said, it's different because you're American, but um, I think he's just trying to use us to get his message across. I left the next morning uh, for the interview. I met him just outside of Kabul. Uh, there were, as Mike mentioned, two Afghan colleagues with me, Tahir Ludin, who's an Afghan journalist, um, incredibly brave person. He had set up the previous two interviews with this Taliban commander and knew the commander, and then Assad Mangal, who was our Afghan driver. And I brought Assad because people had recommended to be careful to make sure we had a lookout, an extra person, in case anything went wrong. Uh, we got to the meeting point, which was just a few minutes, well, 20 minutes or so outside of Kabul. And the Taliban commander who we were supposed to meet wasn't there. He told us to drive a little farther down the road. And we sort of rounded a corner. And there was a car blocking the road in front of us. Uh, Assad, who was in the front driver's seat, he slammed the brakes on. Uh, to hear in the front passenger seat, he could have, couldn't believe what was happening. And as we stopped, gunmen ran at the car uh, from either side. It's, it's amazing how fast situations can change. And these two gunmen jump in the front seat of the car. One of them starts driving. The other one turns around and points his Kalashnikov uh, at us, and that was it. Just in a matter of seconds, um, we had been kidnapped. Um, and there are all these issues about you know, one of the differences, and, you know, we can talk more about this, is that in Bosnia, um, I felt like journalists were respected. They were, they loathed us in some ways at all sides, the Serbs, the Croats, the Bosnian Muslims were trying to manipulate us, but they saw us as people to, to charm and to trick into giving their side of the conflict. Thirteen years later in Afghanistan, you know, I was a target and nothing else. There was no sense of journalists being independent observers. Um, I learned over the next seven months that the Taliban, you know, this is very hardline faction, the Taliban that had me saw journalists as part of the American war machine. Um, my priority in those first few hours and, and those months was to be a journalist. Uh, my captors were absolutely convinced that I was a spy. Um, in those first few moments, they started demanding to know who I was, uh, my name and my nationality. Um, I told them the truth. I thought if I lied, uh, they would find me on Google. Um, and I remember the driver of the car, as we were just in those first few moments when I said I was an American, um, it was actually uh, November 10th, 2008. Uh, Barack Obama had just been elected president of the United States. And uh, when I said I was American, the driver sort of raised his fist in the air 
and, and grinned because he had an American captive and said, we will send a blood message to Obama. They took us out of the car, I remember, to hear leaning to me in the back seat and saying, you know, once they'd taken us to the desert, once they'd stopped us, and when they started to order us out, to hear leaned over and said, they're going to kill us, they're going to kill us. And when we got out of the car, though, their real anger was at to hear an Assad. And I saw through the next seven months that the, the, they really loathed the Afghans who worked with Westerners almost more than they loathed me. They saw them as sort of betraying Islam, betraying Afghanistan. Um, they blindfolded me. Um, I thought potentially we were all going to be shot, but they then sort of loaded me in the back of the car. Um, and, you know, we were moved through Afghanistan over the next several days. Um, I had done the interview near Kabul. Um, I had tried to be safe. You can laugh at that. Um, my family certainly did when I came home. Um, I had told my colleague Carlotta Gall who I was going to go see. I had given her uh, the commander's phone number. I had said exactly where we were going to meet him and told her to sort of start calling my phones at, you know, mid-morning um, if by, you know, a certain time in the afternoon to call the U.S. Embassy. Um, all that happened. And when the U.S. started looking for me, um, and this was a theme I saw with these insurgents, they were like, you know, uh, the U.S. Embassy inv is involved. That means he's a spy. Um, everything that happened somehow would reinforce their sort of conspiracy theories about journalists and who I was and, and you know, how, how incredibly uh, lucky they were to have me and how valuable I was. Um, in those first few days, they were able to move us, to my surprise, frankly, across three different provinces of Afghanistan. Uh, we never saw any Afghan or American forces during that period. They're very clever. I was in the back seat, the far back of a sort of station wagon lying in the back with a sheet over me. Uh, there was the station wagon and essentially a motorcyclist behind us. And, you know, there was no reason to know there was a foreigner in the vehicle. I remember at one point they um, stopped in order to get out and walk through the mountains. Uh, they told us there was an American military base in front of us, and they said they were taking us to southern Afghanistan. We weren't sure where we were going. It ended up being an 11-hour walk through the mountains. And when we finished the walk, uh, another vehicle picked us up. And I don't know if many of you have covered uh, South Asia or not, but we uh, got out of the vehicle and the first thing I noticed was that the driver um, of the new truck we were in started driving down the left-hand side of the road. And this was a very bad sign because in Pakistan, uh, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. In Afghanistan, they drive on the right. And we had walked over the mountains into the tribal areas of Pakistan. This is the FATA, federally administered tribal areas. Uh, we, at that point, were in South Waziristan, uh, the place where everyone thought uh, um, bin Laden was hiding. Um, and they just drove brazenly into this large town, Wana. It's the capital of South Waziristan. Um, all government checkpoints were abandoned by Pakistani forces. I saw, you know, signs welcoming us to Wana. Um, and instead of, you know, any kind of Pakistani military force or police force, it was Taliban manning all the checkpoints. And they were in complete control of the area. Uh, they drove us then up farther north to a place called North Waziristan and a town called Miran Shah. And that's where we spent most of our um, seven months in captivity. But what was most disturbing to me was the sort of mentality of my kidnappers. And I just want to be fair. I was among the most hardline Taliban. It was the Haqqani network that kidnapped me. This is a family based in sort of eastern Afghanistan and the tribal areas that has worked with Arabs um, since the anti-Soviet jihad. And my kidnappers would tell me how they couldn't understand why the United States had turned against them. Um, they believe the 9-11 attacks were staged. Um, they created a pretense to you know, occupy Muslim countries. They believe that Afghans were being forcibly converted to Islam, that Afghan women were being forced to work as prostitutes um, on American military bases. And uh, they were convinced that Westerners were weak and we were sort of obsessed with earthly delights. When I would sort of complain to them about, you know, you're holding me, I can't communicate with my family, uh, they said, well, you know, your government does the same thing in Guantanamo Bay. Um, and when I would complain about missing my family, they saw this as weakness. I lived with a suicide bomber for several weeks, and he, um, I asked him, will you miss, miss your family when, um, you know, you carry out your mission? And he said, no, the only relationship that mattered to him uh, was his relationship to God. There's a Saudi program that tries to kind of deprogram suicide bombers and one of the things the Saudi government does is they force them to live with their family again. And what I noticed was that these were all young boys 
removed from their families, told that their relationships with their families didn't matter, and it was all part of this sort of long, cynical process of brainwashing them to the point where they were, you know, he was eager to die. He couldn't, couldn't wait to die. It was, you know, terrifying, and that mentality was real. And, it, and that, the tribal areas, you know, was and still are um, this area where young Afghans and Pakistanis mixed with Arabs, Uzbeks, um, and other militants and sort of buy into this kind of broader al-Qaeda vision. I think there's different Taliban who are less radical, who are in southern Afghanistan fighting just for control of their village or their valley that are much less ideological, but I think there really is a threat uh, from these groups. Um, you know, I don't think the answer is, you know, invasions and we saw what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I'm also alarmed at sort of the isolationism. Uh, there's a tendency to just think that we should just stay out uh, and there really isn't a threat. I think there is, and we sort of have to think of a new way um, to respond to it. We did escape after seven months in captivity. I'm standing here today because of Tahir Ludin, the Afghan journalist I mentioned earlier, and his bravery. Um, I did chores and in the house every day, and while doing my chores, I found this car tow rope in this uh, last house we had been moved into. At the same time, Tahir had been very clever. He would be taken out... Uh, when they would buy food, he would sometimes go to the doctor in town pretending he was sick. And, you know, he did that over the seven months and got to know the layout of the town well. And we, the power actually came back on. It was always off and on because of fighting in the area. And we ended up um, uh, that night, uh, I essentially got up to go to the bathroom. I've been ordered to never get up and go to the bathroom without their permission. I'd actually tried this in an earlier house, and, and it had worked. And so I just got up went to the bathroom, and none of the guards woke up. Um, Tahir then followed me, and we used, we went up on the roof of the house we were on and used the car tow rope, tied it to a wall, and then uh, came down the rope, uh, landed in this little alley, and then Tahir, who knew the layout of the town, did an incredible job of sort of guiding us to this Pakistani military base. The problem there was when we approached the checkpoint, the guards, excuse me, the guards thought that I was potentially a jihadist myself, I had local clothes on, and after seven months of beard down to about here, um, we froze. Uh, Tahir, again, was brilliant. He's a Pashtun, a member of this sort of ethnic group in the South that has a, a code called Pashtun Wali. And under Pashtun Wali, under the tribal code, you can request uh, shelter from a fellow Pashtun. They have to give it to you. Um, the guards that, that night were Pashtuns as well. They radioed their commander, and believe it or not, um, the commander was like a 27-year-old Pakistani army captain who was chatting on his cell phone to his girlfriend that night. Um, technology permeates these areas. Um, you know, they looked me up on the web, the Taliban, and knew everything about me. Um, he let us on the base. That young 27-year-old let me call my wife. Um, I actually remember calling in the answering machine, picking up at our apartment downtown. Um, and there's, we still have the tape of me saying, it's David, it's David, we've escaped. Um, and then my, uh, a woman picks up the phone and says, hello, and it was actually my mother-in-law. Um, I wasn't the greatest son-in-law ever, <laughs> two months into the marriage, getting kidnapped. And she had moved in, essentially, with my wife for five of the seven months of the kidnapping, helped her throughout this. My wife had continued to work at Cosmo, and the Times was absolutely incredible from beginning to end in terms of this kidnapping. Arthur Sulzberger was incredibly generous. Um, they did everything they could. We can talk about the news blackout. Um, and I can't tell you how grateful I will always be to the Times. Um, you know, my wife was able to call Richard Holbrook, who had helped get me out of captivity in Bosnia. He called the Pakistanis, pressured them. They flew a helicopter onto this base. And Tahir and I were, uh, were, were eventually flown out. Uh, the driver, we had left him behind. He had started cooperating with the guards. I can talk more about that. The Times, again, along with the driver's family, sent a delegation in after Tahir and I returned home. And we were able to get the driver out as well. He returned home about six weeks after I did, uh, after Tahir and I did. And um, I'm elated and very lucky that the three of us um, survived. Um, if we hadn't, I'd, I think I'd have a lot more issues of my own about why had I done this, why had I taken the risk, and why had I gotten these Afghans hurt. Um, I'll take questions now. The book I'm working on is Beyond War, and it's back to this question of these moderates. You know, you've all met them, you've all worked with them in foreign countries, and they never end up running those countries. It's always the guys with the guns or the guys that are more corrupt. And 
I'm sort of searching for a middle ground. I do that politically in my column and in terms of foreign policy. In Mali, I just wrote, there's an, Jim Ledbetter, my editor at Reuters, is right now trying to improve a very weak column I just wrote on Mali. I don't think, how can we support moderates? How can we promote economic growth? How can we create incentives um, for Islamists, more moderate ones, to be part of the world community? Um, again, I don't think the answer is invasions, but I don't think the answer is just drones either. You've served time in these countries. We can talk about it more. I feel like if we try to do less in fewer countries over longer periods of time, we'll be more successful. These massive efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan to sort of create democracy was too much too quickly, and I just fear we're going to the opposite extreme. And there are moderates in these countries. There are Afghans. Many more Afghans have died fighting the Taliban than Americans. You don't see it in the press, but it's happening, and that's sort of where I am now. And I, I got questions, and I'll be honest about it. Um, Leaving the Times was a really difficult decision for me. Um, the paper had been absolutely incredible. I did it because of two things. Um, my, my wife, and more than that, my mother was, uh, you know, I called my mother. I remember I'd made it to this, we were flown to this American uh, base in Afghanistan eventually, and my mother told me she loved me, but then she said, uh, I'm revoking your passport. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I wanted to become a columnist. Um, it was a way for me to write about foreign affairs without having to go to dangerous places. That's what uh, Reuters offered me. And at the same time, it was a, you know, a way to keep a promise to my wife that my days as a war correspondent were over. Um, and it was a, you know, a great um, offer from Reuters. And I'll be you know, always grateful to the Times uh, for what they did to me. Thank you so much for listening to me today. A bunch of issues from different perspectives.